Way back in the ancient year of 1993, Wizards of the Coast released an exciting new collectible card game, likely themed around the swords and sorcery adventuring that had become popular in their pen and paper role-playing game Dungeons and Dragons. Designed principally by Richard Garfield, that card game would go on to become one of Tabletop Gaming's runaway successes. With tens of millions of players worldwide and multiple billions of cards printed over numerous sets and expansions. That card game is Magic the Gathering, and if you have even the slightest knowledge of board and card games, you've probably either heard of it or even given it a go. Fast forward now to the distant future of 2018, and Richard Garfield has become a household name for tabletop hobbyists. Imagine the excitement then when he announces that paired with Fantasy Flight Games, he'll be working on a brand spanking new card game in a new setting with new mechanics and an exciting new premise that promises to shake up the world of collectible card games for good. Keyforge is a sci-fi tinged and vibrant world of adventure, exploration, and a mysterious resource by the name of Ember, which as the name of the game suggests, can be used to forge incredibly powerful keys that have the promise of opening the storied vaults of Keyforge's world, the Crucible. Your deck represents a gang of creatures and tools that you have at your disposal as you search for Ember to forge your keys and ultimately open the gates to said vaults. Yada yada yada, exposition and lore, blah blah blah. How does the game actually work, I hear you cry? Well, allow me to explain. In Keyforge, you and your opponent will be drawing from a deck of cards that are equally divided into cards from three different houses. The numerous houses that could make up your deck are incredibly varied and individualistic in both theme and mechanics. And the way in which they interact with each other will be generating the wild and wacky combos that you'll be playing throughout the game. The wild Brobnar Giants are unparalleled damage dealers for those looking to crack some skulls. The Master Thieves of Shadows can pilfer Ember straight out of your opponent's stash and the Untamed will unleash a series of game state altering tricks and beasties. Depending on the house makeup of your deck, you'll need to find the synergies between each gang of ghouls to get one up on your opponent. In most 1v1 card games, your primary concern is combat. Just like in Magic the Gathering, where you'd be battling to decrease the enemy's life pool down to zero before they can smack you up themselves. In Keyforge, however, combat is merely a means to an end, and whilst it might be important for removing creatures that are scarpering your plans or providing too much of a boon on the other side of the table, your main concern at all times is to generate Ember. Ember can be generated in a number of ways, from cards that give you some for free when playing them, to actions that will offer up some Ember up in exchange for meeting certain criteria. Your most steady supply of those golden nuggets, though, is your creatures, who, once played to your battle line, can forgo combat to instead make a reap action, which exhausts them in exchange for one ember, basically mining. If you manage to start your turn with seven or more ember, you can spend it to forge one of those fabled keys. As forging has to be your first action, once you've reached that seven ember needed, your opponent will have an entire turn to try and prevent that from happening by either dwindling your supply or increasing the cost of forging with their own tricksy cards. The first player to forge all three of their keys will claim victory and will go and pilfer some ancient treasures from the Crucible's vaults. A lot of the additional rules in Keyforge you'll most likely be familiar with from games like Magic or just the 100 card games that it inspired. Creatures come in exhausted and ready up at the end of their turn. There are some creatures that can hit others without taking damage. You can stun creatures to stop them acting etc, etc. Most of the complexity in Keyforge, as within Magic, comes from the long list of keywords that add special effects to your cards, make them more or less potent in play. The nice thing about keyword systems is that you only have to learn their specific rule when they appear on one of yours or your opponent's cards. Hazardous enemies will deal damage to you before you try and attack them. Uh, Omni cards can be used by any house. Some creatures will activate special effects when performing basic actions like their attacks or reaping, etc, etc. It's all quite standard fare for a card game, so what is it that makes Keyforge so special? What sets it apart from the plethora of collectible card games that it competes with? 
Well, first of all, and probably most notably, Keyforge is the world's first unique deck game. Whenever you buy a deck of cards to play Keyforge with, that deck is completely unique from every other deck in the world. Every single deck that you can buy is pre-assembled, ready to play, and has a completely individual card selection drawn from a pool of around 400 for each set, as well as legacy cards from previous sets. The deck also has completely unique card back art and a unique name randomly generated with your deck. Singing from the same hymn sheet as a lot of modern video games, this all seems to be done through procedural generation that uses an algorithm to generate balanced decks that, in theory, will be equally strong as anything else in the world and can be used for anything from tournament to casual play. There's a few reasons this is not only really exciting, but also quite clever and a big deal for any of you who haven't yet dipped your toes in the murky waters of competitive card gaming. The most obvious one is that it completely eliminates deck building. This is not only a breakdown of a massive barrier to entry for new players, but also means that if you buy a deck right now, it's ready to play straight out of the box, and you'll be able to keep playing that deck against any new sets that pop up in the future. That also means you don't have to meticulously follow some grand meta and spend hours modifying your perfect deck to be able to play something competitive. In theory, all decks are equal and powerful in their own ways. One of my favorite things about Keyforge is that it doesn't ask you to try and win the game before it's even played by creating cheesy, annoying decks, but instead to try and work with the tools that you already have and your ability to adapt based on the hand that you've been dealt. All of the fun of the game happens in the game itself. This also opens up a fun new way of approaching tournaments where you can just turn up, pop open a deck and see how far you can get with it. How cool is that? The second way in which Keyforge takes a dunk on its opposition is through some truly elegant and intuitive mechanics. Gone are the convoluted mana costs that you needed for each card in Magic the Gathering, and in their place is one of my favorite parts of the game, which is the houses. At the start of your turn, you'll need to declare one of the three houses that makes up your deck. Then, in any order that you choose, you can play, activate, fight with, reap or discard as many cards as you want, so long as they match the house that you declared this turn. Any other cards belonging to the other two houses are out of reach unless you get some fancy card abilities that let you circumnavigate that. Incredibly easy to grasp mechanic and very, very clever. Here's why. Say that on your turn you manage to draw an entire hand of creatures from House Dis. You'll be able to place down a massive and powerful battle line full of nasty creatures with their own effects and specialities. Nice. The following turn, you draw another good hand of potent cards that you're looking forward to unleash on your opponent. However, there's a problem. None of the cards in your hand are from House Dis. You probably played them all. That means that you'll either have to not use a single one of your creatures that you played last turn, or not play a single card from your hand. Instantly, you're faced with a difficult puzzle that Keyforge can provide tools for you to solve it with. If you reap with every single one of those disc creatures, you could be one ember away from forging a key in a single turn. But not only will you be depriving yourself of all the good cards in your hand, you'll also have the exact same problem next turn, as you can't discard anything in your hand to make room for new options. That is why it's very clever. Theoretically, it's also pretty cheap to start playing as well because all you need is a deck and either some tokens or a friend who owns those tokens. But this is where it gets a little bit difficult and where things will really start to depend on your preference. Look, look, all right, I can already see a group of people shouting expletives at me at the idea of not being able to build their own decks, which I completely understand. Deck building is a massive part of why some people love competitive card games. It's a huge draw for people to be able to customize their own collection of cards and adapt and change that deck over time. For me, it's really just not that high on my priority list. I usually find deck building a chore unless I'm really, really into the game. That in itself can be a double-edged sword though because once you've gone into the deck building, you miss a few releases and the meta could completely change. So completely, in fact, that you have to relearn the whole system all over again. I used to be really into Warhammer Underworlds and spent time tinkering with my deck and trying out new combinations until I took a break and the whole game changed. Now, in all honesty, I can't be asked. 
A second problem that comes with a lack of deck building is that sometimes the balance can be a little bit wonky. As is always the risk when using random elements, sometimes you just get a bad deck. Sometimes you get something absurdly powerful by accident. It can happen. And once again, that will make a few people hesitant. Honestly, I embrace the randomness, but I'm not a competitive player, so take that as you will. There are some other factors to consider, like pricing and theme and all that jazz, but I think by now, if you haven't already made up your mind, the best thing to do is to find a friend who already plays, or a board game club or cafe near you that hosts Keyforge Nights, and just give it a go. I really love this game. I think it's smart, good looking, exciting, and most importantly, I think it's really fun. Thank you so much for sticking around for this Why You Should Play video on one of my favorite card games, Keyforge. Uh, as I said, it's not for everyone. It's a bit of a weird one, but I also think it's gonna really shake up the card game industry. There could be some really, really interesting new things that get worked on because of how different this is from most of the things you've played. And yet, it shares a lot of the DNA that you're probably already familiar with. If you enjoyed this video, then we have plenty more to give you. In fact, there might even be some popping up on the bottom of the screen. But most importantly, please do click on this big round subscribe button so that you can see our videos in the future. And if you want to get notified whenever we put one live, you can click the bell icon below this video and you'll get a notification when we've put our new videos up. We also stream every week, so come and join us for that as well. Thanks very much for watching. I hope you enjoy Keyforge if you decide to give it a go. And most importantly, have a lovely day.